when you submit your spirit back to the father of your spirit, his names become active. And therefore, when you speak, shaman means air. Uh, it's where shaman comes from. But name begins to overtake air. And so when you're speaking the word of God into the atmosphere, all of a sudden the atmosphere is reformed, as it says in Hebrews chapter 11. All of a sudden, he reframes the atmosphere of the 13 colonies. And that's what's going on. This year, he's reframing the atmosphere. He has started it, and he is going to be reframing the atmosphere of the original 13 colonies of this nation, therefore unlocking root structures and altars that have been planted deep within the earth of righteousness and causing them to come forth and reform a nation. Let's give a shout over that. And so all of a sudden when you're in a different dimension, you see from that dimension. And that's really what I want to talk to. Now, what Bobby was saying about kingdom is key. Robert and I's new book is called A Triumphant Kingdom. And it's the apostolic church, uh, the ambassadorial church advancing. That's what we're doing right now and moving forward. And then another book that I'm recommending to everybody right now is Time to Defeat the Devil. If you don't have that book, this book is very helpful for you. It's a book on healing, and it's really about how the devil doesn't play fair with you. That's why he seems to always be pushing us back because he's not going to play fair. The minute you get hit, he's going to hit again. And so you have to learn how fragmentation works in you and how to get all those pieces back in place so you've got strength. And so this becomes real important as we move forward. And if we don't have uh, enough materials back there, uh, for me, you can have any three books for $25 so you can get what you need. If they're not there, you just write on our website and tell them I was at this meeting and uh, they ran out of materials and they'll just send it to you for the same amount. So let's continue to look at why God keeps drawing us together. Because... I I sat there this morning amazed thinking about how in New England and the 13 colonies what the Lord had done. Let's just give him a hand clap. I mean, there were times when you would not experience this uh, here. And so... To see how the Lord is amassing and drawing together is just amazing. But I think part of it is, you know, it's about the voice this season. We'll look at that in a moment. But I think the voice of the earth is crying out. I think earth is crying out and earth is saying, I want liberty. I want liberty. I want to be healed. And put your hand on somebody and say, you're the healer. I believe if we did a map of this room, now when I'm saying that, I mean every place that we represent in this room, all the way to Georgia, to Texas, back down to uh, uh, the Carolinas, uh, if we did a map of this room, the word of the Lord says, every place our footsteps can be ours. So when we come to a gathering like this, in the anointing that God has gathered here, when we're sent out, this is what makes us ambassadors now. It's just not some uh, conference. This isn't what this is. This is a kingdom gathered meeting to send us out for the mission ahead. And so that becomes important, and it really becomes important because We're focusing on the original colonies of this nation. And that was the battlefield for America, and I believe it's still the battlefield for America. And 
uh, all you've got to do is step back and look and you'll see where we must go to battle to see uh, the Spirit of God move in new ways. Now, with that, another thing that I want to say is we're seeing the vision that God has for the original colonies come into a new dimension. And so, you know, I love what the Message Bible says. Your vision is on the way. Everybody say that out loud. See, all you've got to do is walk in this room and look around, and you have faith for uh, uh, America in a way that we haven't seen it in a, in a while. And it, it's it, what the Message Bible says, your vision message is a witness pointing to what is to come. In other words, what you're saying is like a pointer, uh, and it targets and says into the atmosphere, this is coming. And then with that, the vision, Habakkuk says, will come at the right time. And so that now is being released through you and is projecting through the atmosphere, and all of a sudden it will be established. Now here's something else that becomes very important for us. Uh, uh, Denny, uh, Steen, and I were visiting at breakfast because we had a move of God in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, the Jesus movement, and that moved into a third wave movement, especially in the Baptist church and uh, Vineyard and various groups entered into this third wave movement. And with that, it was a move of God. And, uh, and then you ended up going into the manifestation that came from Toronto and Brownsville, Argentina, during the beginning of the 90s. I mean, it was just amazing what we began to see. Well, it, it's as if right now we're in the next move and next era of Holy Spirit movement. So the way James and the way John and the way Peter were, oh, my goodness, that sounds like the disciples here, Peter, James, and John, the way y'all were leading us, to decree we are in this move, let's say it again, we are in this move. I mean, and, and Chad. We're working on it. Matter of fact, he and Aaron were so loud last night in our room. Uh, we were, I was trying to win at playing cards. And they were so loud I couldn't concentrate. And they accused me of everything. <laughs> but I found a way. <laughs> now, now, this Holy Spirit movement is incredible that, that we're in. And I think you're going to have to start watching for the move of the Spirit. Therefore, if you're not learning the person of Holy Spirit, you're not going to see this move the way you should be seeing it. And that's a danger if you have come from uh, traditional type gatherings. You're not going to be able to see Holy Spirit the way you need to see Holy Spirit. And you're going to be thinking everything is explainable. It's not explainable. You don't want it explainable. You don't want to have to understand everything. And now you need to put your hand on your brain and tell it, let loose up. <laughs> See, your brain will demand, the brain is in enmity, the mind is in enmity with God. And so if you just have to have an understanding over everything, you're going to not enter into this move of Holy Spirit. You're going to have to see how the Spirit is progressing and moving and learn how to go with them. Because in this new era, it's already in the atmosphere. That's why we're singing the way we're singing and saying the way we're saying. And we're privileged to go all over the world. And you're seeing a new move of the Holy Spirit yeah. worldwide. Uh, and you want to understand that this is a move here. Say it out loud. This is a move. What we're experiencing here, the atmosphere we're experiencing is a move. But yet in the midst of it, 
Judah is coming forth. Now, Judah is coming forth. That tribe is coming forth in the body of Christ right now. Judah will manifest and must manifest first. And I think we saw that here. I think we're seeing that when Judah goes first, then it's easy to go to war behind them. And that becomes important because we're moving into revival, awakening. And here's the word that I want you to grab hold of, conquest. Everybody say conquest. conquest. See, uh, what I see that you guys have done over the last two years you set out on a conquest of the original 13 colonies. And you're continuing to have to gain strategy. That just means a grouping of plans and ideas brought together to get, uh, uh, to get clarity for war. You keep moving in conquest in these 13 colonies. And you can't let up until you see the full breakthrough. Now, I do want to say this. Uh, prophetically, concentrate on Massachusetts for a while. Massachusetts has to come into a breakthrough, into the atmosphere in a way. It will affect this whole nation. You're going to hear about Massachusetts this year uh, in uh, concerning our nation. It will keep coming up over and over concerning our nation. And so we're going to have to stay concentrated on Massachusetts, its roots, its effects on the 13 colonies, its effects on America, and what is going to happen to shift the future of America. Another one of the states you want to listen carefully for is Maryland. Maryland is a peculiar state, but it's got a history in it that becomes important for this era. And so you want to go back and look. You want to find if there's thin places, like Bobby was saying and what I had last night. If there are thin places in Maryland where the Spirit has come down, you want to find out the blood uh, ground of Maryland and how it has not been liberated. You want to look into some places in Maryland because I think if we see Maryland set free, we'll have a a, a beachhead to move toward Washington, D.C., And so it becomes important that we start looking at all of our places like that. Now, this is what this era looks like. There is pay, the number 80 in Hebrew, that we've entered into. But I I think Bobby used the scripture for 2020 out of 2 Chronicles uh, that Jehoshaphat said, Believe in the prophets and you will begin to prosper. That is a scripture for 2020 because, see, 20 in Hebrew means hand. Just put one hand up like this. Well, think about it, 2020. Now put both hands up. That means you are called to grab hold and pull back into your place everything that slipped away from you. And so this is a year of grabbing hold and pulling back. And yet, pay means speech, breath. We've got to vocalize. We have to say. We've got to have a voice. We've got to have a vocabulary. We've got to have a a, a communication of what heaven is saying into the earth realm. We can't operate in, I, I I, I call it humanistic religion. And it is so easy for us to get into that where we're just trying to uh, talk the way that you can try to have a good conversation about church. That ain't going to work. It won't work this season. You're going to have to have a vocalization of who you are, who God is, and what he's doing in the earth realm, and you're going to have to have it line up with his word because it's sharp and powerful as a two-edged sword dividing asunder soul and spirit going all the way into the bone marrow. And if there's one thing, and I've told our, our uh, next generation, we have like four generations at our place, and I've told uh, really uh, the ones that, 
are sort of below us, but there's a group that I don't see them able to do what Bobby Connor does. See, I really don't see them able to just talk the word, to rehearse the word. Uh, See, and you don't have to always use scripture and verse, but you want your vocabulary to be from your kingdom. Does that make sense? Your vocabulary needs to be coming out of the kingdom that you're a part of, and you can learn how to do that in whatever structure of society you're in. Because I've been doing it since I was 18. Whether I'm in the business world, no matter where I'm at, or in a government setting, wherever, you can learn to say the way God would say to the group that you're talking to. And so it becomes important that we see that. Now, here are the two scriptures that become so important for this era and this decade. You will also declare a thing and it will be established for you so that light can shine on your way. You've got to learn these two scriptures. Just start simple. Uh, When I was 19 at at Texas A&M, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to be able to read uh, the Bible, the graphe word, without ever opening it. See, and so my whole lifelong journey has been, if I didn't have the graphe word, could I read Genesis 22 in my quiet time? See, without the word of God. So I've got to have it stored somewhere, so I just sit there and read it out loud in my mind. And, and now I might not quote it verbatim like uh, Bobby would quote it, but I can say this chapter is about this, this, and this, and this is what God says in it. See, you've got to be able to do that. Now, what's going to happen now in this decade, the Lord is putting this on us to speak it into the atmosphere so the earth begins to shift. And come into a new fullness. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So when we speak it, the word name is shaman inside of you. When he was knitting you together in your mother's room, he knit together all of his uh, uh, names inside of you. So when you come back and submit your spirit to him, And Hebrews says he's the father of your spirit. Doesn't matter who mom and daddy were. He's the father of your spirit. See, yes, you have to break generational iniquities in your bloodline, but he's the father of your spirit, and that's where you're working from. You're working from a whole new lineage to overcome what's trying to control you. And so in the midst of it, when you submit your spirit back to the father of your spirit, his names become active. And therefore, when you speak, shaman means heir. Uh, It's where shaman comes from. But name begins to overtake heir. And so when you're speaking the word of God into the atmosphere All of a sudden, the atmosphere is reformed, as it says in Hebrews chapter 11. All of a sudden, he reframes the atmosphere of the 13 colonies. And that's what's going on. This year, he's reframing the atmosphere. He has started it, and he is going to be reframing the atmosphere of the original 13 colonies of this nation, therefore unlocking root structures and altars that have been planted deep within the earth of righteousness and causing them to come forth and reform a nation. Let's give a shout over that. Now, here's the other scripture that I love. It's Isaiah 45, 11. It's uh, the Holy One of Israel and its maker. For the Lord says, ask me about the things to come concerning my sons and daughters. Just ask him. Ask him about the sons and daughters. And I, I loved what 
Al came over here to say, and what Bobby said a minute ago, it's not about how you start it, it's about how you finish. Ask him how certain sons and daughters that are aligned with you are going to finish, then start speaking it. Start speaking it, and it will put light on their path. See, same way, ask him how uh, certain states were meant to be. Start speaking it in the state, and then it will put light in the state and cause that state to have to realign some way. So it becomes important. He says, command and give me orders concerning the works of my hands. Put your hands back up again. He's putting anointing on your hands, and he's putting an anointing on your voice so that you command him, and once you command him, his hand goes to work. See, it's, it's almost like he's just waiting and saying, I'm waiting on you to tell me what to do. And I'll start moving in new ways like never before. Now, this is what I want to end up with for up here. Because, you know, knowing a lot about New England and marrying New England from uh, my wife being from New Hampshire and being a part of New England many, many years now. Uh, matter of fact, going 47, that's, a, that's big. That's big a long time. Uh, and in the midst of it, uh, you, you know how astute and creative God made New England and the 13 colonies. They couldn't have survived. They couldn't have accomplished what they accomplished without uh, the power and creativity that is in them and the ingenuity that's within this people being fully unlocked. So the last two years, I've asked the Lord, what are you saying to this year? Last year, he said, uh, 2019, I, I said, Lord, what are you saying about this year? He said, plow through it. And we did that. We plowed from one side of America to the next. But we had to plow through it personally as well. It was like just plowing through. When you, you couldn't see how a crop would come up, you just kept going deeper and plowing. And this year I asked him, and he said to me these words, uh, I want you in this year to tighten up your belt. Now, that has certain meanings to it, but it has a financial meaning that's important. It has a, it has a meaning that says uh, you're going to be able to gird up your loins like Elijah did and ran faster to get to the gate. You're going to be able to, in the midst of finances not flowing in certain ways, tighten up your belt, and I'm going to show you how to do new things. All right? Now, and so what he said was this. He said, tell my people to tighten up their belt because I'm going to teach them how to do exploits. Now, what that means is they're going to take what they have and bring it into something new. And I think you made this statement. That's what exploits really is. You look at a resource and all of a sudden he decodes that resource to show you how it can multiply in new ways. See, I think, I think we think too much about money. And money represents resource. But if you don't think about resource, you're not going to... Uh, be able to unlock the multiplication that is necessary as we go forward. And so with that, in everything you do, I want you to get this thought in your process. When I look at something, how can that change into a different dimension of resource? See, start thinking like that. Start looking at your state like that. 
Don't listen to the naysayers saying everything is drying up. Well, then you'll take what's dried up and you'll make it into something else. That's what exploits do. I mean, think dried fruit. You can make an awesome compost from it, you know, and, uh, 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 and really use it in numerous ways. So we've got to think differently as we go in because starting in April, it will be different. And I'm not a doomsday prophet, but you do have to know things are changing. And so because of that, God is going to change us and cause us to be very creative. Now with that, put one hand here and one hand on your brain and say, let's link up in a new way. All right? Now, now remember what I said last night. We are entering into this concept of a divine return. That means we're coming face to face with the Lord. He's bringing us back. He's going to show you how the enemy took from you. A lot of people will say, that the, I just want back what the enemy took. No, you don't. You want to know, once you know how he took it, you want to know how he took it. Because once you know how he took it, you get it back double. You get it back quadruple. These are all biblical multiplication. You get it back seven times. Seven times can turn to ten times. Ten times can turn to thirty times. Sixty times. Uh, up to a hundredfold. You can get it back a thousand times. But you've got to see how the enemy did what he did. Once you see how the strong man is holding what is yours you go in and plunder or pilfer that strong man because you have right to pilfer it. Now, that's a hard concept for a lot of Christians, especially if they have lived in a mentality of um, Calvinistic thinking. I don't, I'm trying to say it real nice. If you've lived in a thinking process like that, You have the thought process, well, if God wants me to have it back, he'll get it back. No, he won't. He will tell you how to go in and get it back. And you're going to have to know this is an active decade, an active era that we've entered into. It is not the same. So we're having to face off lots of things. We're having to face off past fears. We're having to face off our pursuers that tried to run us out of the place that we were supposed to have. We're trying, we're having to face off enemies. You are aware you have enemies. And once you see that there is groups that have embraced antichrist thought processes, eventually their heart hardens and they become an enemy to anything that has to do with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you have to watch and see, is this person, uh, it's not about just uh, a person not being saved, it's about a person becoming an enemy to the gospel. And so we want to be able to notice those who are becoming enemies to the gospel. And then you have to look back at your wilderness and you have to say, I'm not willing to live there anymore. And that is not always easy to say that because they never went hungry in the wilderness. They always had good clothing in the wilderness. But they just went in circles And they had no creativity in what they ate. Some of us giants like creativity in what we eat. (laughs) See what I mean? Who wants to eat the same meal for 40 years? So, in the midst of it, you have to think, we all, and we all go through wilderness. You can't sidestep it because Jesus didn't sidestep it. 
But here's what I, I, I was listening while uh, things were being said. You can determine how long you stay in it. I mean, he made it through it in 40 days. One group stayed in it 70 years in Babylon. Another group stayed in it 40 years. So you need to say, I want the 40-day plan. And you need to say, I I don't want to stay in this much longer. I mean, seriously, you have to say that. You have to say it out loud. You have to speak it into your atmosphere. On February the 1st, I I was at the drugstore, and I I said, you know, because you travel a lot, I usually get a flu shot. And... I remembered I hadn't had a flu shot. My wife was with me, and of course she was saying, you shouldn't take that flu shot. You know, she's one of those that... (laughs) That's how America's going to become... That's how the zombie movement's going to come, the flu shot. (laughs) And it might be, but... I always have... I'm always torn because I react to so much stuff... And yet, if I, t- I was going to Nigeria once, and I had been so sick. And they said, the only way you can go is take a yellow fever shot. And I thought, that can send me into crazy places in my body. And so, uh, but the Lord had told me to go to Nigeria. And so I... I got all torn up in this thing. Should I take the shot? Should I let a mosquito bite me? What would happen? You know, where where am I at with all this, you know? And I went to Pam, and she said, what is the worst thing that could happen to you? I said, well, I could die. She said, well, but God told you to go to Nigeria. You can die in Nigeria. I said, this is not helping me. She said, but I know how crazy you are. Once you get to Nigeria and a mosquito bites you, you'll go, she said uh, different words, but (laughs) you will go crazy there, and Brian will have a mess on his hands. And so I say go take the yellow fever shot, and you'll be okay. Well, I get there to take the yellow fever shot, They're about to give me this shot, and I said, what are the side effects of this yellow fever shot? And she said, no, this is what the lady said. The lady said, oh, you're supposed to be taking yellow fever. I had another shot I was about to give you. There I go. She said, let me... Go get a yellow fever shot for you. I said, my gosh, what was I about to take, you know? I run out. To, Pam went with me to the health department. I run out and start screaming. They, they're about to give me something I didn't even come here for. Well, anyway, I took this flu shot, and immediately I started having a reaction. And the nurse there knows me. And she said, what some of these do, they will work in your body for three or four weeks. And yes, you're not getting the flu, but you're building up resistance against the flu. And you don't, you feel different. People like you, she said, (laughs) feel differently. I mean, this woman knows me. I've been, she's been my nurse for 20 years. You, they feel differently, so you don't need to get upset. Well, I haven't been able to breathe since I took it. I have been on planes. I'll cough, you know, because I got asthma from it. I got, I've been on planes. I cough, you know, they look at me like, I mean, put him in. Hey, I'm, I, all I can think, I'm going into prison when I get off the plane. I was up here on the third floor, started coughing before I got on the elevator. The girl went down the stairs. She wouldn't even get on the elevator with me. (laughs) So, Bobby, I'm telling you, it's going to be hard to win the lost. 
They're running from me right now. But while we were ministering and James was singing, all of a sudden, I had Cheryl lay hands. I had a knot like this out here. I had Cheryl lay hands. The knot went down. I had Chad lay hands. The knot went down further. All of a sudden, I don't have a knot anymore, you see. So we, we've got to see how active we have to be as we move forward because really, we're going to enter into our promise and conquest. Everybody say conquest. Now, that's what I want to leave with you now. We are in a conquesting time. And I want you to think about Joshua versus Moses. Two different worlds there. Two different worlds. And you've got to think about the tension. And you've got to think like this as you start moving from state to state throughout these 13 colonies. You've got to think differently. You really do have to think, what were the real issues when they finally crossed over? Everybody say, finally. finally. God had waited on this group for 476 years. Finally, he had a group that could cross over. Finally, he's got a group that can cross over here. Finally, he's got a group that can cross over. And so with that, Joshua had to take, Moses was the best leader ever. Don't ever take that away from him. He had an, he had an anger problem, and the people would provoke him to anger, and he killed the guy, and he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. Now, that's a word for you. Be careful how you speak. Don't, don't do things. God, it, we're in a speaking season, not a striking season. And so you got to be careful with it. But remember, he had to do these things. He had to divide the land among the tribes. You've got to see how your state is, is divided up. And then who is in that portion of that state that has rulership? See, once you do that, you're going you're gonna to be looking at the apostolic rule that God is developing for the whole state. But you've got to look at it by the Spirit. It's, it can't be just mega churches because mega churches tend to do what Bobby was describing for us, become the styrofoam cup where it just stays within that group of fellowship. We're talking about land, atmosphere, and the harvest being unlocked in a territory. And so you've, but you've got to recognize your tribes in a region, the different types of tribes. And for that whole region to be taken, those, all those tribes are important. And you've got to find those that are filled with the Spirit of God. See, that's why all that false unity that went on in the 90s, don't get into all that either. That ain't going to work. You can try to get every pastor together, nothing will happen. Except you'll enjoy each other. You'll know who you are. You'll have a good dinner. But that's not what things are about this season. That's why the Lord said, when Judah goes first, Issachar has to go with them, and so does Zebulun. Issachar had to, was the prophetic tribe who knew Torah and could tell time and, and no strategy to do. Zebulun had the money. You're going to have to have all three of those to win the war. Judah going first with sound and that war cry within them. I'm not talking about just a praise team. I'm talking about a war cry. Everybody say war cry. Then the thing that the Lord told Joshua was, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to meditate day and night on Torah. See, that's what made Israel so different. It's the nation God gave his word to. We had to be grafted into that. He gave it to them. And he said, you will succeed 
if you meditate day and night. Now, what happened at Ahai, they quit meditating. Because they looked at it not from God's perspective, but man's perspective. And so, we've got to come into a new dimension of the Word of God. Then you're going to have to come into a mentality of conquesting the land. That means you're going to have to have, you're going to have to see that the presence of God is changing, the way that we've had meetings in the past are changing. You're going to have to see new leaders are rising up to be trained, and you want to find some that know how to go to battle. For the future, you've got to see that provision is changing. When they went into the land, they had not worked for 40 years other than to tear down the uh, uh, tent and move it. You have to think like that. They had been living off supply that they had brought out of Egypt and supply that God was giving them on a daily basis. And when they went into the land, all that stopped. Therefore, they had to shift into a new ability. But look what was before them what had been amassed for ten generations, all the wealth that had been amassed for ten generations, and the Lord was saying, I've been waiting on you to go in to unlock it. See, if we start thinking like that, we're going to look redemptively at each state of these 13 colonies, and we're going to say, this is what has never gotten unlocked here. This is what I know God wanted to unlock. You can see it in history. And it never happened. See, then all of a sudden, you're going to see it happening. And war strategies are changing. That's the issue of 2 Chronicles 2020. War strategies are changing. I'm going to have you go and, and you, and don't get, I've heard a lot of people religiously use that scripture and say, well, the battle is the Lord's, not mine. The battle was the Lord's, but he said, you're going to go stand at a certain place in the midst of it. Then, and you're going to start singing, and you're going to start worshiping. Then I'll come down. Everybody say, we're ready for then him to come down. (laughs) So you want to see that this is happening. Now, let me leave this with you. There are strategies that are necessary for conquest, provision, and success. And God is requiring it out of us this season. These strategies, we can hear him. He is giving us access to hear him. He's making us available to hear him. I, I, have, I prayed for Chad just two days ago. Uh, because I went home to work on this book that is, that is due now, and he said, I can't tell you how I heard God. He told me what to do and how, by doing that, he prospered me within an hour. See, he's giving us access to do certain things. He's giving us new abilities to do certain things. But you're going to have to know your field. You don't want to be running into fields that you don't belong in. Uh, I used to would walk from our house. I could take the road and walk over or ride my bike over to my grandmother's house. And that, that was two miles from us. Or I could cut across the field, which was like, uh, you know, maybe a half a mile. Well, again, us bigger boys like to take the half mile route it's just simple I mean why do all that energy let's just cut right across here I'll be there in a minute the problem was one field had horses in it which I could manage that one the other field had bulls in it and I had to determine, looking in the mirror, if I could run. (laughs) So there were times 
I chose the long route because the energy to get through that short little field that I didn't belong in could take me out. Now, don't get into field. This is the way of, of understanding warfare. You live in warfare. You live in God's abiding presence, but the enemy hates it so bad he's always trying to pull you out of it. That's called warfare, where he wants you out of the presence of God. So you're warring to stay in the glory realm. That's what you're warring for. You're not, and in the midst of it, you've got to know that if you get in fields or in wars you're not supposed to be in, that grace of abiding isn't always there for you. That's why a lot of people get messed up, because they shouldn't have been in the field to start with. They shouldn't have gotten in that war to start with. And now they're in it. Now they've got to get the grace to find their way out of it. See, that's, it becomes an important understanding as we move forward. You've got to know the other key players in your field. Who's going to war with you? See, that's why meetings like this become so important. This is a remnant that says we won't change in the 13 colonies. You have to know the growth factors that you're facing. How can that field prosper? You need to be asking, telling the Lord, and I, he doesn't mind you doing that, that you want to prosper. Say it out loud. Lord, I want to prosper. I've got a book called A Time to Prosper written from a Hebraic standpoint. You want to prosper. You were meant to prosper. It, it, that's not saying you're supposed to be rich. You were meant to do it. It's not saying that we're all going to be millionaires. It's saying whatever you put your hand to, you succeed in what God's telling you to reach out for. Let's stand up to do that. This is how I feel like we're to end. I'm going to ask our worshipers to come up again, Peter. Now, I want you to extend a hand to heaven and say, Lord, fill this hand. Anoint this hand. Now reach out that hand to earth. See, once he anoints it, it needs to go somewhere. It needs to reach in and begin to prosper. Now, I want you to take somebody's hand and say, God wants this hand to multiply. God wants you to optimize all the resources. Now, take their hand and say, he wants you to learn how to battle with your hands. Say this out loud over them. He wants you to be stronger than the opposition in your field. Now, reach that hand out one more time. He wants you to touch into areas that have never been touched into. Now, Lord, I loose a creative power. I unlock that creative power in these 13 colonies, in your people in these 13 colonies that has been locked up. I say the unlocking has begun. Now multiply, multiply. Shout it seven times. Multiply. Multiply. Now, if you haven't given, I want you to get a, or if you, even if you have, just you want to give into this type of breakthrough God is calling you to. And in doing that, you're going to shout multiply when you give. You're going to shout optimize when you give. Lord, we say 
Let now everything that has never come to fullness be unlocked in these 13 original colonies. And we say, let the awakening begin. <laughs>